You're listening to ReachMD XM160, the channel for medical professionals. Welcome to Advances in Women's Health, sponsored in part by Eli Lilly. Your host is Dr. Lisa Mazzullo, Assistant Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Northwestern University Medical School, the Feinberg School of Medicine. What makes women more competitive? The answer could be in her hormonal milieu. And with me today is Dr. Oliver Schultes, the Chair of Experimental Psychology, Motivation, and Neuroscience at the Friedrich Alexander University in Erlangen, Germany. Today we are discussing whether estrogen X is a power hormone for women and what effect it has on women's behavior in general. Welcome, Dr. Oliver Schultes. Well, hi, Lisa. Thanks for having me. So, you know, you had seemed to be dedicating your life to the evaluation of hormones and motivation in men and women. And today we're going to be talking about women. In your recent study, talking about estrogen fueling female power, I just found that fascinating. What do you mean by female power? Uh, by female power, I mean the, the drive for power for dominance. And usually in, in a kind of cultural stereotypes, that's something that's more attributed to men than to women. But women have a power drive that is just as strong as it is in men, at least when we measure it with our instruments. And women learn as much from power situations, from what worked and what didn't work, and they use it in their subsequent behavior just as men do. And in the end, it's rewarding, at least to some women, at least to those who are power motivated. They like to go for the power stuff. And how do you measure the estrogen in these studies? We take saliva samples from our participants, which means we... Um, put little collection tubes in their faces and ask them to spit into them with the help of a chewing gum. Initially, it's embarrassing after the fifth or sixth uh, sample, they're getting used to it. And from these saliva samples, we can later assay uh, all kinds of hormones, steroid hormones, and estrogen and testosterone in particular have been the focus of our studies in recent years. Do you think that there's a positive trend of estrogen in women who are what we consider overachievers versus those who are more non-productive? It depends a little bit probably on what you mean by overachieving because uh, achieving or achieving motivation has many connotations and we as psychologists we usually separate that out from power motivation. If you mean by it that these are women who are driven and who want to achieve a lot in their careers, it might be. But I'm speculating here because I haven't studied these women. I haven't looked at women who are kind of ahead of the pack and what kind of estradiol levels they have, because they usually are not available. They are too busy. <laughs> but I would speculate that, yes, there might be a link. You had also, I think, in previous studies, looked at the effects of progesterone on motivational behavior. Can you comment a little bit on what your findings were at that? With progesterone, we seem to have found a kind of hormonal basis or a hormonal correlate of affiliation motivation in both men and women. Uh, all the world is usually talking about oxytocin as the cuddle hormone or the love hormone, uh, but it's very, very difficult to measure in humans. And more or less accidentally, we stumbled across progesterone being associated with our measures of affiliation motivation. And then subsequently, we ran a couple of studies in which we, for instance, presented movies or parts of movies to our participants. And in one such study, we, for instance, presented Bridges of Madison County with Clint Eastwood and Meryl Streep and measured progesterone levels before and after that movie and compared that to a control condition where Participants watched a neutral control movie, documentary about the Amazon, and scenes from The Godfather in another condition. And only in the Bridges of Madison County condition, where the theme was very romantic, did progesterone go up, both in men and in women, interestingly. In the other conditions, that didn't happen. So maybe arousal of affiliation motivation and affiliation motivation as a trait in humans is linked to release of progesterone. So generally, I find it fascinating that you used films to motivate the people because, you know, it's such a subjective measure. You know, films are something some person will say, oh, that didn't move me at all, but something else, you know, somebody can't stop crying during the Bridges of Madison, myself included. So what made you decide to use that as the motivation? Because when, when I watched that movie with my wife, I, I noticed that this movie is really almost purely about affiliation. There's, there's not a power theme in there. It's not about achievement. It's motivationally pure. It's really just about romance and two people trying to find each other. And in the end, that doesn't work out for them. So it was uncontaminated by the motives, the motivational arousal factors. And that was something that I was looking for because most movies try to pitch together uh, incentives for affiliation, for power. And, and think of your classical action movie where in the end the hero saves the girl. Okay, That's power and that's affiliation. It's everything in one. And I wanted to separate out 
those different components and go for movies that were motivationally pure, so to speak. Did you use any other testing tools beside the estrogen or progesterone levels in the studies looking at the motivation of these women? Yeah, we also use an instrument that we call the picture story exercise, which requires our participants to write short stories about ambiguous pictures showing people in relatively everyday situations. And we later code the stories for content and look, for instance, for affiliation themes or for power themes and then use the tally of those themes in participant stories to predict their either their um, baseline progesterone or testosterone levels or changes in these levels in response to specific conditions. And that is how we get to people's power and affiliation motivation. We don't go for self-report measures because they usually do not do a very good job of predicting physiological changes in response to motivational incentives. So there are other studies that you've looked at evaluating implicit affiliation arousal and affiliation stress. Can you talk a little bit about that? My graduate student, Michelle Wirth, and I did a study uh, in 2007, it was published in 2007, in which we looked at what happens if you're being exposed to a situation that is stressful for your need to belong to others. And we can't do that really very well in the lab because in the lab we're bound by certain ethical constraints of what we can do to participants. It wouldn't be fair to people to deprive them, for instance, of valuable friendships just to to figure something out. We're glad you feel that way. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, But on the other hand, you have those wonderful movies that people, that real experts at their craft uh, design to give us an appreciation of what it would feel like or be like to be in that situation. And that one particular study... We use scenes from Steven Spielberg's Artificial Intelligence, where you have a scene in the movie where a boy, it's a robot boy, of course, but you you tend to feel with him after a while, is being abandoned by his mother in the woods. It's a basic, archetypical kind of situation of abandonment, and it triggers a powerful panic response in the boy, and as a viewer, you absolutely have to suffer with the boy. And we were interested in what that was doing to participants' hormones. In that study, we found that participants responded with an increase in cortisol to the situation. And cortisol, of course, is a hormone that is being secreted, among other situations, when you're under stress, Mm -hmm. when you can't handle the situation, when you're kind of out of your depth and your body braces itself for for the long impact of a stressful situation. And I think when cortisol goes up, would you agree that also the precursors for estrogen and progesterone also may rise? That is true. That can be a correlate, although the body is really careful in separating out which hormone it will produce from cholesterol. All these hormones are derived from cholesterol, but the body tightly controls what kind of enzymes convert cholesterol eventually into one hormone or the other. So there usually is a correlation between those steroid hormones, but uh, they seem to function independently for the most part. Was there anything else about that study that you found was surprising to you that you were not expecting? The the one thing that we, of course, were surprised by and and not so happy with, but that's what happens in science, is we try to replicate, on the other hand, our Bridges of Madison County effect um, with progesterone, and this time we didn't find it. So, But what we did find in general, which kind of goes again, for the hypothesis that affiliation is related to progesterone is that those people who increased from before to after the movies in general in their progesterone levels were also the ones who increased in their affiliation motivation. That's a situation that you often find in science, that you have some evidence. Not everything will always replicate really well, but you find bits and pieces that you have to add up to a puzzle in order to eventually understand the entire picture. And we're still working on that. One important question I'd like to ask you about is the effect of oral contraceptives in harnessing or changing the estrogen levels in these women who have power motivation. I would think there is an effect, although we still have to look more closely at that. I mean, usually what happens with oral contraceptives is that the typical gonadal axis is being shut down in its normal functioning. So you do not release the proper levels of progesterone estradiol anymore because you fooled your body into thinking that there's already enough to go around of the stuff and so don't produce anything else. The question really is what happens if power motivated women who are on the pill and have a power success or have some kind of a power defeat, whether they will still show the responses in, in estradiol or not. And if so, what they are being mediated by, whether what, what can explain this effect. This is something that is actually the next frontier of research for us, figuring out what drives these changes in estradiol, whether they're coming from the ovaries, whether they're coming from other sources in the body, and if so, what triggers them so quickly. And just one last question. When you're looking at their study women, have you factored in BMI at all because we feel there's more estrogen coming from fat or more obese patients than those that are thinner? 
We have measured it. We haven't looked at it directly, but it will be an important factor to figure out in the future. In general, the, the population that we looked at at that time was pretty young and student population. Some of them may have been a little bit overweight, but in general, those were still relatively lean young people. I mean, usually the ballooning happens a little bit later in life, and it would be interesting to look at that too, whether kind of constant levels of estrogen produced by uh, by the fatty deposits in the body moderate the effect or have an impact on power motivation. Thank you so much, Dr. Schultes. We've been listening and talking to Dr. Schultes about um, motivational behavior and the effect of estrogen in women, and he's been our guest discussing this. I'm Dr. Lisa Mazzullo. You've been listening to Advances in Women's Health on ReachMD XM 157, the channel for medical professionals. Please visit our website at reachmd.com, which features our entire library through on-demand podcasts, or call us toll-free with your comments and suggestions at 888-MD-XM-157. Thank you for listening to Advances in Women's Health, sponsored in part by Eli Lilly, with your host, Dr. Lawrence Stryker. For more details on the interviews and conversations in this week's show, or to download the segment, please go to reachmd.com forward slash women's health. Breast cancer. Those are two words your patients don't want to hear and news that you don't want to deliver. Unfortunately for one in eight American women, it's a truth they'll have to face in their lifetime. And the risks are clear. Besides being female, the two major risk factors for developing breast cancer are advancing age and family history. In fact, about 80% of women diagnosed with invasive breast cancer are age 50 and older. And while family history of the disease is an important risk factor, up to 80% of women diagnosed with breast cancer don't have one. Unfortunately, many women still have misperceptions about who is at risk. They think, I don't have a family history of breast cancer, so I don't need to worry. My mom had breast cancer, but I'm only 43. The good news is that with early detection, we can try to reduce the risk of breast cancer mortality. Through awareness and education, we hope to improve patients' willingness to be screened for breast cancer. To help in this effort, Lilly has created the Strength in Knowing Breast Cancer Awareness Program and website. It's designed to educate women about their individual risks and provide a means for them to share this knowledge with others. At strengthinknowing.com, women can hear from professionals as they discuss the importance of knowing the risks of breast cancer, find out about events they can attend in their city, and help spread the message. The resources may also be helpful to you and your practice. There is strength in knowing about the risks of breast cancer. So spread the word today. Visit strengthinknowing.com and tell your patients to visit too. I didn't realize I was at risk until I visited. I told my sister, my mother, and my aunt. This program is sponsored by Eli Lilly and Company. Answers that matter.